East Blue, Alabasta, Sky Island, Water 7, Thriller Bark, The Summit War. everyone and welcome to my review for each arc in one piece the time has come for the climax of the summit war saga no the climax for the first half of one piece itself each arc and every saga has been leading up to this moment Marineford is a staple of One Piece history. Like, it's in everyone's top five, and you are lying if you say it's not. When new fans start the series, we all look forward to when they reach this arc. Because nobody's like, Aw oh, man, can't wait till you reach Whiskey Peak. A non-stop war between the entire Navy and the Whitebeard Pirates for the fate of Port Gas D Ace. New and old faces gather together for a battle that will reshape the series we once knew. Marineford is amazing. Like, even to this day, I still get goosebumps from re-watching the arc. But it's not perfect. The biggest issue with Marineford's anime adaptation are the horrible pacing issues. Most episodes of Marineford could easily be summed up as somebody does a thing, everybody reacts to that thing, A screams a bunch, the prisoners worship Buggy for three minutes to be continued. Despite that, Marineford's pretty good. Today, I want to remind us all how Marineford changed One Piece. So watch out for earthquakes, stay away from volcanoes, and get ready to cry a lot as we witness Marineford, the war of the best. Marineford is 31 episodes and 31 chapters. As the Neo Straw Hats set sail towards Navy HQ, Ace prepares for the worst day of his life. He puts on his fresh pair of J's and begins to walk to his death. Meanwhile, the rest of the world gossips about the upcoming war between Whitebeard and the Navy, discussing who'd win and what the outcome could mean for them all. Over at the Saba Odi Archipelago, the entire island watches Moist Critical's livestream of the whole event. Marineford, a town once welcome to families of Navy soldiers, has been turned into a war zone, with 50 battleships and an army of Marines 100,000 strong. The entire Navy prepares for the biggest battle of their lives against one of the four emperors. The Navy has summoned its most elite soldiers from all over the world. Aiding them are the five out of seven warlords of the sea, the government dogs. Standing above are the strongest marines in the world. Introducing the power of justice, the three admirals. Which, fun fact, the admirals are designed after famous Japanese actors. See, this is what's so wild to me. They did all of this for one of the four emperors of the sea. So hypothetically, if another emperor showed up, the navy would be screwed. Ace sits on top the execution platform, ready to clock out from reality. But Sengoku decides to troll the kid before his death. Like an episode of Mori, Sengoku reveals the truth about who Ace's father really is. Afraid that Gold Roger wasn't a virgin, the Navy scoped out any woman who might potentially carry his child. Months to years went by, and no matter how many families they broken up, they couldn't find any trace of Roger's legacy. However, one woman tricked the entire world government to protect the safety of her child, a woman named Port Gas D. Rouge, pulled off a feat that could solo the verse. An iconic moment so tremendous, even Goku would struggle. For 20 months, she held on to her child. Oh, uh, this? <laughs> Yeah, I just ate a lot of burritos. <laughs> Sex? Never heard of it. 
I'm too busy eating burritos to have a baby. Once the Navy finally gave up their search, she gave birth to the next generation. Before her death, a boy initially called Gold D Ace was born. Way to immediately put a target on your son's back, Rouge. Monkey D Garp comes into the hospital fully aware that Rouge had a child, as he's come to fulfill a promise from his greatest rival. That's right, Whitebeard. You are not the ah! Check Until Monkey D Dragon was confirmed to be Luffy's father, I could easily see how someone would think that Gold Roger was the son of Luffy. But. Oda likes to do things a little bit different. After Sengoku gave Ace one last fuck you before his death, the Navy's worst nightmare comes to reality. In the shadows emerge the many pirates who support Whitebeard, ready to attack, then making their grand entrance, the flagship known as the Moby Dick, breaks through the heart of Marineford. Emerging from the ship are a group of warriors proud to call themselves sons to their captains. Introducing the Whitebeard Pirates' 14 Division Commanders, and leading this group is the strongest man in the One Piece world. A proud warrior and an even greater 21-foot-tall father who wields a weapon on the same level as Hawkeye Mihawks, and was once a terrifying rival to Gold D. Roger. This is one of the four emperors of the sea, Edward Newgate. We've got plenty to talk about. Like you not killing my son. That's literally not your son. It's no secret I like the dub. However, for me, the biggest atrocity is the fact that Whitebeard's voice actor doesn't do the laugh. <laughs> we truly live in the dark timeline. And right away, Whitebeard rings the gong of war as he immediately shows off his devil fruit. Wielding one of the strongest paramecia types, the world bears witness to the Quake Quake fruit, a reality bending power that allows Whitebeard to call forth tremors that can shake and destroy islands. Just then, Ace recounts his journey as a pirate, setting off to sea on a quest to make a name for himself as the leader of the Spade Pirates. During his journey, he even meets Shanks, and once Ace brings up Luffy, they have a party. And what's your plan? I'm gonna defeat the most powerful man in the world, of course. So, so Kaido then. then. After an intense battle with Jinbei, Ace comes face to face with the man he's been searching for. Whitebeard smacks some sense into Ace. Realizing his potential, Whitebeard offers to spare the Spade Pirates in exchange for making them his sons. Moments later, Ace wakes up aboard the Moby Dick, and since then, time after time, Ace tries and fails miserably to kill Whitebeard. Eventually, Ace comes around to understand the love Whitebeard has given and proudly wears the mark of Whitebeard on his back as the second division commander. Just then, on a seemingly normal day, the perfect family of the Whitebeard pirates began to break apart. Possibly? Ace, take a look at what I found. Oh, uh, is that a devil fruit? I think so, but I don't know what type it is yet. For those that don't know, there's actually a two-part light novel series recounting the events of Ace's pirate journey before becoming a member of Whitebeard's crew. And then later, Boichi actually made a manga adaptation of that light novel with his really striking, amazing art. So, definitely worth a read if you haven't checked it out yet. Back to present day, Whitebeard's powers causes a giant tsunami, hoping to speedrun the war. But for our boy Aokiji, water is his playground as he turns the waves to ice. However, the Whitebeard pirates use the ice to their advantage as terrain for the battle and begin to charge. The war has officially begun. Normally, Hawkeye has no interest in small squabbles, but he realizes the perfect opportunity to test his abilities. Just how does the world's greatest swordsman compare to the world's strongest man? With a simple swing of his sword, he instantly outperforms every feat Zoro has done in this show so far as the blast rushes towards Whitebeard. <laughs> Ah! 
Whitebeard may be the strongest pirate in the world, but his crew aren't a bunch of pushovers either. Introducing the 3rd Division Commander, Diamond Jozu, who ate the terribly named Twinkle Twinkle Devil Fruit, allowing him to turn his body into diamonds. So basically, he's just Mr. One, but better. After the Fraud Hawk's terrible display, we move over to Kizaru, who follows the method of taking out the leader straight away. He goes guns a blazing at Whitebeard. However, Kizaru forgot about the one thing that can beat light a pineapple. Introducing the first division commander and right hand man of the Whitebeard Pirates, Marco the Phoenix. Just like his name suggests, Marco ate the bird bird fruit model Phoenix. While Logia fruits are indeed powerful and rare, just like a card game, mythical fruits are like a limited edition, ultra rare, PSA grade 10, signed by the author worth $1,600,000. Why is the One Piece TCG so expensive? Also, I just gotta say that every time we see Marco, he gets a major glow. All right, so ice and light. We've seen the ridiculous powers of Aokiji and Kizaru respectively, but what could this flower boy possibly do? Great ah, magma. Yeah, they're fucked. Sakazuki, the Navy's loyal red dog, ate the magma magma fruit, said to be one of the strongest pure offensive fruits in the world. For Whitebeard, it's just a fun little candle to blow out for his birthday. The battle continues on as the other Whitebeard pirates show off their insane skills, but the Marines won't budge either. Oh, Kobe and Helmeppo are here too, for some reason. I thought this was the war of the best. The pirates. My enemy. This isn't a training exercise. This is war. <laughs> this is not people. Hancock joins the battle, but not only is she fighting the Whitebeard pirates, she's also attacking the Marines too. Allies or foes, all men are equally worthless. Boy Hancock 101. If you have a penis, then you're the enemy. As the battle rages on, the biggest ally of the Whitebeard Pirates charges forth. A beast said to be three times the size of a regular giant, whose sword can cut through battleships like pancakes. Introducing the captain of the Little Pirates, Ors Jr., the ancestor of the original Ors. And of course, Moria is absolutely excited to start Thriller Bark 2. Ors Jr. rushes through the battlefield. The once towering giant unit of the Marines look like babies in comparison as they are easily taken out. However, Little Ors finds himself against the government dogs as Kuma the Tyrant uses the same move that destroyed Thriller Bark to deal serious damage to our demon dude. Ors Jr. manages to survive, only for him to make the horrible mistake of attacking Don Quixote Doflamingo, who cuts off his leg. Then Moria finishes the job by stabbing the giant straight through the neck. Yeah, so, uh, that didn't work out too well. During the war, Garp questions his morals. While he believes criminals deserve their punishment, the fact that his own family have become the very danger he swore to fight shakes him to his core. He's unsure of what to do as he thinks back to the teachings he tried to drill into Ace and Luke. Who are you to say I can't? It's not like you're my father. Do you want me to show you how much I love you with another punch? Okay, there's a lot to unpack there. The thing is, Garp may be harsh on Ace and Luffy, but he does care about them and wants them to join the Marines solely for their protection. And I feel like in this scenario, Ace finally understands why Garp tried so hard for them to give up the life of a pirate. Because, you know... It's a literal fucking crime. Speaking of Garp's family, the Whitebeard Pirates get some unexpected reinforcements as out of nowhere, Luffy and the Neo Straw Hats fall straight from the sky into Marineford. Garp's not very good at raising kids. And so the Neo Straw Hats enter the war. Luffy takes a second to soak everything in and at the top of his rubbery lungs, he screams to Ace, declaring that he will save him. Hey Garp! Your family's messing things up again! Luffy, no! 
While Luffy is here to save a life, Crocodile wants to do the opposite, as he plans to kill Whitebeard. But he's immediately reminded about the ass whooping he got in Alabasta and Chills. Knowing that they both want to save Ace, Luffy and Whitebeard form an alliance. And so now Luffy is on the run to save his brother. However, it won't be so easy, as he's reunited with his old pals Kizaru and Kuma, who looking to make up for what happened at Saba Odi. Ivankov holds off Kuma while Luffy takes a trip down memory lane to see old Jango from Syrup Village and Iron Fist Full Body from Baratie. Fun fact, there's a cover story called Jango's Dance Paradise about how Jango became a Marine and his rivalry with Full Body for the love of their Vice Admiral Hina. The reunions don't stop there as Moria has the misfortune of seeing the rubber freak that ruined his dreams. Luffy is a lot stronger than most Marines, but their numbers start to overwhelm the monkey. Thankfully, he's got Jinbei to help him out and fend off Moria. And the fun facts keep on coming, because in the Japanese dub, Jinbei and Gekko Moria are both voiced by Katsuhisa Haoki. Even with his allies, Luffy can't catch a break from his past, as now Smoker wants the smoke. Also, Toshiki's there too. I guess. Luffy has definitely gotten stronger since their last encounter, but he still can't hurt Smoker. Although with the power of love, Boa Hancock can defy logic as she defends her beloved and gives him the key to uncuff Ace. Ivankov is confused why his best buddy Kuma is attacking him and not explaining anything. The sadistic pink boy Dolph Flamingo explains that thanks to Dr. Vegapunk's gradual experiments, Kuma has now become the perfect killing machine for the Navy. The latest and greatest PX0. Damn that Vegapunk, he... He... He better have a good explanation for what he did to Kuma. Because that's going to be really hard to explain. Wanting a piece of the rubbery pie is the fraud hawk himself, hoping to make up for his blunder with Jozu. Thinking he's no match for Hawkeye, Luffy grabs the perfect meat shield of Buggy, who thanks to the chop chop fruit is immune to any sword attacks, allowing Luffy to escape. You failed to kill some small time rookie, and now you can't even cut a guy? It's not looking good for Frodhawk. I mean, homeboy can't even beat 5th Division Commander Vista. Dude, just take your black paint and go home. You're embarrassing yourself. Things aren't looking too good for the Navy, but luckily they have their own reinforcements. Led by Sentamaru, the pacifistas march onto the battlefield and blow right past the weaker enemies. Meanwhile, Squard, one of Whitebeard's trusted allies, talks to Pops about the war and their goal of saving Ace. Although Marco gets a weird vibe about their conversation, then the unthinkable happens. Squard stabs his father. Feeling betrayed by the man he was proud to call his father, Squad declares that Whitebeard sold out his allies to the Navy in exchange for Ace's safety. And his angry pops never told him Ace was the son of Gold Roger, the man who killed his former crew. Wanna know who told him that? Akainu! The guy who will murder his own men for not wanting to fight and die in a meaningless war. He's very trustworthy. Normally, Whitebeard would have no trouble with some sneak attack, but no matter how strong you are, you can't beat old age. How does Whitebeard, the strongest and one of the most feared pirates in the world, handle such betrayal from his own men? He hugs Squard and assures him that his father loves all his children equally and that he'd never sell out the people most precious to him. We'll talk about this further into the video, but Whitebeard's undying loyalty to his family is one of the main reasons why he's such a well-beloved character in the franchise. And the other reason because this dude is strong as hell. And after 15 episodes of bloodshed, Whitebeard has had the last straw. He jumps off the Moby Dick and prepares for battle. The world's strongest man makes his move. While Squad has a meltdown from just being a dumbass, Whitebeard reminds us all why he's him. Easily overpowering giants and causing the entire island and nearby sea to tilt. Something I really didn't take into consideration the first time I watched this arc was just how this shows us a glimpse at the pinnacle of the One Piece world. Like, if Luffy wants to be King of the Pirates, 
he's gonna need to be able to do crazy shit like this. The Marines attempt to trap the pirates with unbreakable steel walls, and use Akainu's power to rain hellfire on them, and even destroy the Moby Dick, causing Luffy to fall into the ocean. All seems lost, but nobody accounted for the dead 60 meter giant to block one of the walls. The Whitebeard pirates climb onto Ors Jr. and continue their Google Maps route to Ace. Speaking of Ors Jr., he wakes up! Hooray! Now they can save Ace! Oh wait, Kizaru's still around and is about to kill Ors Jr. Well fuck. Just then, we get one of the coolest entrances in One Piece, as with Jinbei's help, he shoots an ocean current right in front of the three admirals. When the water calms down, Monkey D. Luffy makes his grand entrance. I see. So you found a way up. You've done quite well, son of Dragon. Ah, uh, youth. So much fire. Dude, yo! That was awesome! Right, Kizaru? Aokiji? You are enemy. You, you, you are enemy. That's right. Luffy knows full well he stands no chance against a single admiral, let alone all three. But nothing will stop him from saving his brother. He uses the log to cause a distraction and run towards the execution platform. You can do it, Luffy! He's not gonna save him, is he? The executioners swing their swords, but it looks like they didn't account for the sandstorm as Crocodile unexpectedly saves Ace. While he hates Luffy and Whitebeard, Crocodile loathes the Navy even more and refuses to see them win. As Luffy gets closer to Ace, the challenges become more than he can handle. As he's bombarded with admirals left and right, Ekizaru has this dude on lockdown. The admirals are seriously no joke. Even Akainu is able to give the old man a bit of trouble. Then to make matters even worse, Garp finally locks in and joins the fight. Knowing what happens later down the line in the manga, rewatching this arc, I can say without a doubt that without Whitebeard, Garp solos Marineford. Luffy, completely exhausted, but still beyond determined, asks Ivankov for one final favor. To inject him with some more special hormones, so he can keep going. Respecting his rubbery balls of steel, Ivankov gives Luffy another injection of his special hormones. Luffy gives another powerful scream, and is ready for round two. Full on crack, cocaine, and a sprinkle of lean, Luffy blitzes through the crowd of marines and runs into Kobe. Kobe thinks back to the time Luffy helped gave him the strength to work towards his dreams of becoming a marine admiral. He musters up all his courage and prepares to fight Luffy to the death. Go home, Kobe! All the Marines bum rush Whitebeard. However, they forgot one thing, one crucial flaw in their plan. No matter how many times they attack, the overwhelming odds or clever strategies, the one and only simple reason they could never win is because they face Whitebeard. With just a simple swing of his blade, Edward Newgate turns the tide of battle. This is the power of the strongest in the world. Luffy, struggling to reach Ace and seeing the swords inching closer to his neck, makes a desperate call. Just like the times of Amazon Lily and Impel Down, when Luffy screams, multiple marines and the executioners fall unconscious. The other high-level fighters stand in awe as they realize Luffy has the Conqueror's spirit. Damn! Why didn't I think of that? So I understand hockey wasn't a fully fleshed out system and Oda was still tinkering with it at the time. But now that we know how it works, looking back at Marineford, a lot of problems could have easily been solved with hockey. Closing in on the finish line, Luffy's allies make sure he gets to ace. Inazuma comes in clutch as he uses his powers to make a path for Luffy to follow. Before Luffy can save the day, he's got one more huge obstacle. Monkey D. Garp has come to stop Luffy. Not as his grandfather to scold the boy like always, but as a vice admiral of the navy to deal justice on lowly criminal. 
Neither side wants this to happen, but this is the reality of the world. Both of them reminisce on the good times, but only one of them follows through as Luffy reluctantly punches his way through Garp and reaches Ace. Luffy grabs the key he got from Hancock, but Kizaru personally hates this kid and breaks the key. Then, to make matters worse, Fleet Admiral Sengoku makes his move, introducing the powers of the human human fruit model Buddha, a rare mythical zone type fruit, turning Sengoku into a giant golden Buddha. One of the executioners wakes up to this horrible mess, and guess what? It was Mr. Three! Wait. So that means earlier, Mr. Three attempted to kill Ace. Sengoku decides to execute Ace himself, but Luffy's big belly can stop any attack. In the confusion, Mr. Three makes a key to free Ace as a thank you for a Bon Clay sacrifice. The Marines shoot them all in the sky. At first, it seems like the Navy has won, but with one look at the flames, the answer is clear. Ace has been saved, meaning the war is just about over. Or is it? Many years ago, when Ace was a child, he knew nothing of his family and the role he played in the world. He'd go around asking random citizens and crooks about Gold Roger and whether he had a kid. Every single one laughed at him, saying what a horrible person Roger was and celebrating his death. Unaware of who Ace truly is, they'd all proudly claim that the child of Roger should die, simply for being born with his blood. Garp comes around to check on Ace, who'd come home bruised and bandaged after fighting with all the cronies. Tell me the truth. Did I deserve to be born or what? Definitely not. Condoms exist for a reason. A real fumble. I will unbirth him myself. Not Luffy? Not caring. I'm more of a Sabo kind of guy, to be honest. Thanks to Whitebeard, his crew, and Luffy, Ace remembers his purpose as he fights to live on with his family. With a smile on their faces, the brothers fight together like the old days as they race back to their comrades. But Whitebeard has different plans. Aware that his era is coming to an end, Whitebeard makes his final order. Protect Ace and run away. They've basically won the war. Whitebeard will stay and destroy Marineford as much as he can. Naturally, the Sons of Pops don't want to leave their father, but they come around and listen to their captain. Beforehand, Ace gives Whitebeard one last thank you for everything. And now, I present to you the dumbest and most tragic event in One Piece history. Sakazuki decides to pull some Yo Daddy jokes in hopes of angering the Whitebeard Pirates. Unfortunately, one hot-blooded idiot known as Port Gas D Ace falls for the obvious bait. Everyone warns him to stop, but Ace won't tolerate anyone bad-mouthing the man he's proud to call his father. Ace versus Akainu is a battle of hot versus really hot, as Ace's flames can't handle the heat of Sakazuki's magma. Akainu makes it his mission to end the new age of pirates. He targets Luffy, and before Luffy can react, he's hit with the biggest reality check of his life. Ace has fallen. All the Whitebeard pirates throw their entire arsenal at Akainu, but there's nothing that can stop this mountain of absolute justice. The three admirals are monsters in the One Piece world, but Akainu is in a league of his own. This is someone who puts justice above all else and will do anything it takes to maintain the agenda. The Straw Hats were lucky that it was Kizaru who showed up at Sabaody, because if it was Sakazuki... The series would be over by now. While everyone holds off Akainu as much as they can, Ace and Luffy share their final goodbyes. Ace thanks Luffy for caring enough to risk his life for a good-for-nothing older brother who can't handle a yo daddy joke. Before he goes, he asks Luffy to tell everyone, Thank you for loving me. Limp and unresponsive, Port Gas D Ace falls to the ground and dies with a smile on his face, proud to have been born the way he was. Monkey D Luffy, overwhelmed by the physical and mental pain of this entire saga, from losing his crew, Bon Clay, and now his older brother, crumbles as he's become an empty husk. Don't worry guys, it's One Piece. I mean like, Oda never kills off his characters. Cause if Pell can survive a point blank nuke, then 
Ace could easily survive this, right? Right? With Ace dead and Luffy frozen in trauma, the Whitebeard Pirates stand in cold shock, realizing this entire war and the deaths of everyone were in vain. Akainu doesn't know how to read the room and goes in to kill Luffy. Marco pushes off Akainu and commands everyone to get their shit together and fight on for Ace to keep his little brother safe. However, Akainu learns real fast just how badly he fucked up as Whitebeard shows no mercy and teaches Sakazuki what real power is like. With the might of Zeus, he throws the lava brat into the sky and bitch smacks him like he's laid on rent. Marineford is a very bloody arc. Like, it's so gory that the anime actually had to make some censorship changes to it. One of the biggest examples being how during Whitebeard versus Akainu, Akainu actually tears off a chunk of Whitebeard's face. Whereas in the anime, it was just a little bit of his beard. Arguably worse. Things go from terrible to downright horrific, as lurking in the shadows is the man responsible for this whole mess. Whitebeard's former child and crewmate, Marshall D. Teach, aka Blackbeard. And with him are five new crew members he grabbed from level 6 of Impel Down. The largest creature in history, San Juan Wolf. The corrupt king, Avalo Pizarro. Oh, fuck! The heavy drinker, Vosco Shot. Crescent Moon Killer, Katarina Devon. And finally, the former jail manager of Impel Down, Shiryu of the Rain. Welcome to the new and improved Blackbeard Pirates. Whitebeard upholds Ace's mission to kill the traitor who destroyed the family. Blackbeard's darkness fruit is powerful, but no one is a match for Newgate as he quickly takes down Teach. Blackbeard attempts to plead for his life, but Whitebeard has made up his mind and goes in for the kill. But with a desperate sling of his gun, the battle has been decided. With zero hesitation, the Blackbeard pirates rush at the near-death Whitebeard. A barrage of gunshots and stab wounds leaves the island in awe as they watch Whitebeard's life slowly fade away. Why- why is nobody helping? Marco, what the fuck, dude? You can literally fly! After the bloodbath, Whitebeard still lives, but not for long. This mountain of power looks at Teach and simply says he's not the one chosen by Roger. The will of D, whatever the fuck that is, won't favor a freak like him. Whitebeard says that someone, someday, will carry on Roger's legacy and another for Ace. Knowing full well what he must do, just like Gold D. Roger once did, Whitebeard makes history. The One Piece! The One Piece is real! After announcing to the world that Roger's treasure does exist, Whitebeard thinks back on the history he has built. He's achieved many great things, but the one thing he will forever be grateful for is the family he has cultivated. Whitebeard was truly a man among men. He was insanely strong physically and emotionally, and he represented one of the core values of One Piece as a whole, being the idea of family. How you don't need to necessarily be related to someone by blood to truly matter to them like a family member. And we've seen that countless times over with characters like Bellamare to Nami or Dr. Here Look to Chopper and so many examples prior to that and further down the line as well. Closing his eyes and letting the tides carry his soul, we say goodbye to Edward Newgate. His legacy was a sight to behold. With 267 sword wounds, 152 gunshots, and 46 cannonball shots, not one time in this battle or throughout his whole life did Whitebeard, the strongest man in the world, ever run away. In the eyes of the general public, the deaths of Whitebeard and Ace are a proud moment to be celebrated. But around the world, to a certain few, they've lost someone very dear to them. Now that the Whitebeard pirates and marines are beyond exhausted, nobody can stop Teach, as he uses this opportunity to show the world something that defies reasoning. After a few minutes, the time has come for the Navy's reckoning. With just his right hand, Blackbeard 
reminds us all the terrifying powers of the darkness fruit. But there's more, as on his left hand comes a power we're all familiar with. Marshall D. Teach has obtained the powers of the Quake Quake Fruit. Since the beginning, we've known that if a Devil Fruit user attempts to consume more power, they will explode. However, mysteriously, even to this day, Blackbeard has found a way to nullify that setback turning him into a true monster. Right now, Sengoku is forced to fight off Blackbeard. Meanwhile, Jinbei and the gang aren't out yet as Akainu crawls from the depths of hell to finish the job he started. Kobe wakes up to a multitude of noises. Somehow, in the cries of war, he can perfectly hear the voices of his fellow marines thirsting for the deaths of the pirates. Right before Akainu can complete his goal, another Darut Sandstorm comes just in time to send them flying right into the arms of our lord and savior, Buggy. Blackbeard might now have two Devil Fruits, but Luffy's already had a second power known as the Plot Plot Fruit, using it to conveniently summon Trafalgar Law, who's come to save Luffy. The Marines already have taken two major Ws, but they're greedy for more, as they won't stop until every pirate on the island is captured or dead. For Kobe, this war went from a necessary evil to a dishonorable mess. It has now become killing for the sake of killing. Kobe demands Sakazuki stop this nonsense. The war is over and they've won. Playing with the lives of humans is wrong. Too bad for Kobe as Akainu loves murder and attempts to squash our glass of pink lemonade. Although a certain one-armed, three-scarred, red-haired man loves pink lemonade and a good speech, it's the mighty red-haired Shanks, one of the four emperors of the sea. Hey, bud. We need you to report some lines for Shanks. Oh my god, really? Do you have a lot of lines? And screen time? Oh my god, finally, I can live a good life and finally afford rent? I haven't seen my family in weeks. I mean, you have like a page. That's about it. With the red-haired pirate's arrival, the Marines feel ill-prepared for a second war. However, Shanks has come for a different reason, to put a stop to the senseless violence. The Marines got what they wanted, let the dead rest and tend to the wounded. Heeding his warning, the Blackbeard pirates dip and Sengoku announces the end of the war with the bitter victory of the Marines. Okay, get back here! I agreed to fight Whitebeard and his allies, true, but red hair is another matter entirely. Further into the ocean, Trafalgar Law works on Jinbei and Luffy's injuries. With Luffy's thoughts deep in the depths of despair, it'll take a miracle to save this rubber lad. To be continued. That's the end of the Marineford War arc. Holy fuck, that was intense. Like I said, Marineford is the culmination of One Piece, a battle against some of the strongest characters we've seen so far. Cause Luffy is strong, that's for sure, but this saga made it clear that he's definitely reached his limit. Oh, Ace's death is extremely shocking because from what we've known of One Piece up until this point, it is very rare for a character in the present story to actually die. Because a lot of times Oda is very unsure about killing off his characters and sort of like takes it back. But yeah, that's pretty much it. Let me know. But yeah, that's pretty much it. Let me know your thoughts for the Marineford War arc and just the Summit War saga as a whole. Thank you guys very much for watching. Like, comment, subscribe, the whole YouTube shebang, and I'll see you for the finale of the Summit War saga. Bye.